and I'm looking at six o'clock. So uh, it just introduced myself. I'm Jenny Cropper Rhines, and I am ch the chair of the Osha Pines Communications Committee. And uh, for those of you who are online as guests, we are glad to have you and be able to have um, Travis Brown from the health department here with us and also Delegate Hartman and Commissioner Cipertino. And I believe we'll see someone, uh, Pat Shader from Mary Beth Cruz's office. Um, Travis is gonna do a presentation for us and then we'll open up to questions. So while Travis is doing his presentation, if, the, if you all will put yourselves on mute so that uh, we're able to hear him without interruption. I'll um, let you know when we're all finished and we can unmute and ask questions. And we'll also read the questions that were sent in to us. So Travis, I'm gonna hand it over to you and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Should I go ahead and start? Um, it's 6.01, I guess everyone's here. Do you wanna wait longer? I think that you can go ahead and get started. I think that, um, you know, people will have opportunity for questions. So it looks like we are getting more people logging in. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, so my name is Travis Brown. I'm the public affairs officer for the Worcester County Health Department. Um, Josh and Commissioner Bertino were both kind enough to invite me to log on to this kind of virtual town hall, which we are trying to do um, as many of us, uh, as many of them as are requested. So we've already done a couple. Um, and this one, I've just got a really short presentation about our vaccine registration process. And I know Josh has collected some community questions. I'll be available for as long as people need to field any ones that come in and anything that I can't answer, I promise I will figure out and send you tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Also, if anyone hears any snoring, that is not me. I've got my uh, new Weimaraner puppy up in my office with me, and he is very loud sometimes. So I apologize if there's any noise. OK, it looks like I'm sharing. I'm going to go ahead and run through this very quick Google Slides presentation. So I think the main questions that everyone has right now will be about COVID-19 vaccine and registration within the county. Right now, as of last week, we have moved to a single central waiting list that includes all clinics operated by the Worcester County Health Department. To register for this waiting list, you just need to call 667-253-2140. And that's during business hours, Monday through Friday. Now, due to limited vaccine supply, we do not expect to post Worcester County Health Department clinics onto MarylandVax.org for the next several weeks. For those of you who have tried to get on and um, register for a clinic, you've probably used MarylandVax.org in the past. We understand that it has probably been a frustrating process. Um, it, that is the, the report that we've been hearing from a lot of people. If vaccine was plentiful, we definitely think that MarylandVax.org would be a wonderful resource, very convenient, easy to sign up. However, um, we're averaging about 300 doses uh, of Moderna per week. Those are first doses. We get a separate um, allocation of second doses, but those are already spoken for. So with about 300 doses per week, whenever we were putting clinics on MarylandVax.org, they were going immediately, usually within 30 to 40 minutes, all of the spots and then all of the waiting list spots were filled. And the previous system, each waiting list was tied to an individual clinic. So once that clinic was finished, uh, the waiting list was dissolved and people would have to try again. We know that that was not very um, well received, even though that was the system that we're all working with uh, in, in terms of the state framework. So we have on our own moved to this single central waiting list that is now scheduling appointments. As of the last night of this morning, I think that we were just shy of 5,000 people on the waiting list. Um, everyone who's on the waiting list is eligible, either in phase 1A, 1B, or 1C. Now, due to the state directive, we are prioritizing those who are 65 plus. So I know one of the questions that might come up uh, later that Josh had sent me is that, how are we picking people from the waiting list? It's a mixture of first come, first serve, and then by age. So anyone who's over 65, uh, the earlier you signed up, the earlier you will get a call or a message uh, indicating that there is a spot available. And then we do also have a allocation um, 
that we're supposed to set aside each week uh, from the amount that we get from the state for educators. I believe it's usually a third of what we receive. I'm going to get all of that in writing. I know that we've got some internal memos. We'll make sure that everything that I share is public information, and I will send it to Josh tomorrow for distribution to anyone who's interested in how those determinations are made. So that's just a little bit of a blurb about our uh, vaccine registration waiting list. Again, that number is 667-253-2140. If you are calling because you are eligible, whether you are 65 and older or you're just trying to get your name on the list for later, we know that it has been uh, a long period where people might be on hold or trying to connect to people. I promise that we have every available staff that isn't already helping with clinics or doing something else vital helping with the call center. Uh, and luckily volume has gone down. As soon as we opened this waiting list last week uh, or the week before, I think it was uh, very close to that. One of the first days we averaged, it was like 3,600 calls. The Worcester County Health Department has about 250 staff and we might've had something like 50 or 75 who were available for the call center. It was just a huge avalanche of volume. Um, luckily now it's, it's quieted down a little bit. So we are working to catch up and put people on that list. But again, per the state's directive, we are prioritizing 65 and older. So a little bit just about the phase system. Right now we are uh, just in phase one, which includes 1A, 1B, 1C. This is sort of the full list, which is also on our website, worcesterhealth.org, of who is in each category. Uh, 1A is primarily healthcare workers, people who are frontline and often running into contact with COVID-19. 1B is assisted living, other congregate settings, um, 75 and older education continuity of government. Then 1C is the 65 plus essential workers, agriculture, manufacturing, postal. Uh, we don't have a timeline yet for when we expect to get to phase two. The understanding is it will likely be a state shift that will more or less be moving together. And Governor Hogan has indicated um, that that will be, and forgive me, I missed his presentation today. So if something has changed and I'm telling you the wrong thing, it, it does you know, we have a, a nice saying, different uh, different day, different way, where it's updated constantly. Uh, so if you said anything this afternoon that contradicts me, I apologize, and I'll make sure to get the correct information to Josh. But as of this morning, I don't believe there's a timeline on phase two. We're just waiting to make sure that we get the majority of phase one vaccinated before we move there. Um, this uh, is just, Travis, there was no news on phase two today, so you're good. Thank goodness. It's every time, I'll tell you, when uh, we, we <laughs> get a, an alert that the governor is going on at 2 p.m. on Facebook, everyone sort of, you know, shivers a little bit and says, I wonder what's going to happen this time. So uh, just some other information. This is as of the end of last week. Worcester County was actually leading in the percentage of residents have gotten their first dose of COVID vaccine. At the time, we had just under 14%, which was nearly one out of seven. Um, I can check it uh, later and send that to Josh. Uh, there's a daily update, but I know that we were in the lead by um, a significant margin over most of the counties. There was one, I think it was Kent, that was pretty close to us. But we are here on the shore, one of the leading areas in terms of getting those doses out. Um, the supply is limited. As I mentioned earlier, we're getting about 300 first doses from the state each week. We have not wasted any of it at this point. Not a single drop has uh, spoiled or not been used effectively. So any doses that we get, we are making sure and committed to getting those shots into arms um, immediately and efficiently. So in addition to the vaccine registration, we are still doing testing. Um, I believe some of these states are moving around. Uh, it's, a, it's a service that we've continued to offer, but at this point also there are a lot of different agencies and organizations open within Worcester that provide testing, which is great. Um, you can go to the hospitals like AGH, uh, any of the PRMC affiliates, any of the walk-in clinics like West Ocean City Illness and Injury, um, Your Docs Inn and Pocomoke, and then a lot of the pharmacies as well. So while testing is still something that's there, it has been, uh, it's very ubiquitous at this point. It is all over Worcester County, which is fantastic. So uh, just a little bit of, and this is a scene, a uh, picture from one of our clinics that was a drive-through uh, for vaccinations. We want to encourage people while they're waiting, you know, try to be patient. I know it's very frustrating if you want that vaccine and you're far back on the waiting list. Continue to practice prevention uh, behaviors. And then here are some additional resources. So MarylandVax.org, we are hoping and planning to move back to posting clinics there as soon as the vaccine supply allows it. 
If you have questions about just general COVID information you're looking for, it's 410-632-1100, option eight. And again, I'll provide all these slides to Josh so that he can share them with the group. Actual registration right now is at 667-253-2140. If you check our website, worcesterhealth.org, we have multiple updates per day. We make sure to put out our positivity rate, our case rate, our uh, vaccine allocation versus administration rate. All of those are done daily, usually in the morning around 10 or 11. And then multiple times per day, we'll be posting social media, any updates that we have uh, at Worcester Health on Facebook and Twitter. We're also on Instagram, YouTube, and we have a weekly podcast. I'll be recording one tomorrow that you can see on the front page of our website where we do just a little bit of a breakdown of the week's COVID information. So I believe that was my entire presentation. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my screen sharing and I'm available for anything you all need in terms of uh, questions or whatever you want to do, Josh. Uh, Delegate Hartman had his hand up for a question or a comment. Yes, thank you, Josh. I did want to say that Worcester County is doing an amazing job in getting the vaccine out. And I do have information as of today. Uh, Worcester County is at 16.2% of the population for the first dose. We are second to Kent County, but you understand our, um, our population is probably almost three times that of Kent County. So you guys are truly doing an amazing job. The, um, the second dose percent of the population as of today is 4%, um, which there's one county that's in the five. So we're, we're doing great there. That's a very, uh, the number of, of counties in the second dose is, is much closer than that of the first. Um, so again, a great job. Um, just for a little additional information, the last seven days, the state has averaged 26,179 um, vaccines daily. That's the average over the last seven days. So, um, it's um if anybody has any other questions as far as the the information um i could answer here i'd be glad to but but thanks again for the the presentation and uh just kudos to everyone involved you worcester county is is just doing great with us so thank you thank you delegate hartman uh i see brian brian r has his hand raised yes brian is here uh, thanks for taking our questions. Um, uh, regarding the county wait list, is that just for the county clinics that are being offered, or does that include vaccinations that you can get at Walmart or or any of the drugstores that seem to be you know spinning up now, or are those separate wait lists? Sure. Thank you for that question. Yeah, the wait list right now is internally only for Worcester <sighs> County Health Department clinics. Uh, the other agencies that have them available within our area, um, HEH, PRMC, they are doing their individual thing. Now we all coordinate. I speak with um, their public information representatives often. I know that Becky Jones, our health officer, speaks with their leadership all the time, but they are independent in terms of how they schedule their waiting lists and their clinics. Uh, in addition to those resources are also some of the private sector. Uh, Walmart has some now, and then I believe that they've been opening up giant Rite Aid and Safeway across Maryland. Um, each entity has its own different wait list and own procedure. Yeah. We were all Go operating ahead and click on the link. All operating under the same phase system and rules. So, and our our wait list, the one that's got about five thousand. Yes, that is just for Worcester County Health Department clinics. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, if anyone has questions, there's a uh, an icon at the top of your screen to raise your hand, or if you want to just start speaking when you hear someone else stop. Susan LaRue, I think I see you with a hand raised. Hi, uh, yes. I'm glad you just um, confirmed the various types of clinics because my understanding was Walmart was going to automatically transfer all of the names that were currently on their waiting list to the health department list. But it sounds like that is incorrect. Uh, if that is true, it's the first I've heard about it. I don't believe that that is the system that they are going to use. Um, there is always room for cooperation with all these different entities, but with us already having 5,000 on our list, uh, it could become a little confusing, especially with Walmart being its own private organization. So to the best of my knowledge at this time, Walmart is still independent in the way that they schedule clinics and use their waiting list. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Rick Cutts. Uh, thank you. Um, I have to second the delegates uh, comment about the, the Worcester County. I, I also have some contacts in Howard County and they're doing nothing uh, close to the, uh, the, the efficiency that you have. My question is this, are, is the county cooperating with AGH in their vaccine program? So um, just reiterate what we were talking about earlier. AGH is independent in the way that they have their own single waiting list and they schedule their clinics. However, I will say that there is a uh, just a general spirit of cooperation between our agencies. Um, I do know, I'm, I'm sure that I'm fine to say this, that at one point we needed some doses of Moderna because we, uh, as the health department, don't have the ability to store the Pfizer vaccine, which is the other one. The state had sent a very large shipment of both Pfizer and Moderna to AGH, and our health officer spoke with their leadership and was able to um, get some of their Moderna because they had enough Pfizer for their clinics for that week so that we could fill out our clinics. We work very closely with AGH and all things, but at this time, we definitely have our own separate scheduling and waitlist situations. Delegate Hartman. Thank you. Um, one quick question as far as our um, teachers and so forth. Do we know how many, what percentage of our teachers that want the vaccine have been vaccinated? Uh, I can check Delegate Hartman and give you that. I do know that in terms of what the state is asking us to do is that they want us to allocate, I think, about a third of our weekly doses for educators. Um, and we know that those caps have been hit. In fact, I think we're far ahead of that uh, because before we were asked to prioritize those who are 65 and older, we got quite a few educators in there. I can get you the exact number and percentage tomorrow, um, but we're definitely ahead of the goals that the state has set. Thank you. Pat, did you have one? Yes, uh, the, I'm in the district office for Senator Carosa, and the two questions that we get asked a lot, well, three, of course, the first one is when can I get vaccinated, but the other two are, whether or not if you th if someone thinks that they have had COVID or they know that they have had COVID, is the county testing for the presence of antigen in the case of whether they think they may have, but they're not sure? And if they have had COVID, it was diagnosed definitely, do they still need to get vaccinated? Sure. Yeah, so I know that ADH is doing antigen tests. I don't believe that we are at this time, but they are available within Worcester County. And then in terms of if you've had COVID, whether it was suspected or positive, yes, the recommendation from the current public health um, information is that you should still seek a COVID vaccination when you're able to. I believe that the last uh, time frame they put on it was to wait 90 days after you were asymptomatic. It's either 60 or 90. I'll 100% find that for you. But the main push is that even if you've had COVID, the vaccine does have a benefit because we're not sure exactly how much resistance just being positive at one time will give you. So we have much harder numbers on the vaccine. I believe with Moderna and Pfizer, they're both upwards of 85 to 90%. So the re recommendation is even if you've had COVID, you get a vaccine um, just sometime after you've been positive and after you uh, are no longer able to get Thank you. Uh, and the other, just uh, my own curiosity, what is the status of the Johnson & Johnson one-dose vaccine? I believe as of last week that they have entered into an emergency petition with FDA. Um, I don't know of any... Actual vaccine supply that's going to come from Johnson and Johnson uh, at the moment, but it looks like yes. I just googled it. The Johnson Johnson vaccine has not been approved yet, it, but it is soon expected to become the third vaccine available to roll out. So we are certainly hoping um, that that will assist. I believe the Johnson and Johnson one is unique in that it's a single dose. One of the difficult things with Moderna and Pfizer is that they are both double doses. So you get one, and then for Pfizer, it's 21 days. For Moderna, it's about 28. You have to get that second booster. Uh, with Johnson & Johnson, it's just a single one. So effectively, the supply is doubled. Uh, we are hoping to hear that that gets approved within the next 
maybe a week or so, and then it should go to the state. Uh, ideally, that will help with our our supply bottleneck, but we do not at this time have enough vaccines to the demand uh, that we are seeing. And is it correct that the Johnson & Johnson has somewhat less efficacy? I think it's a little bit lower. My understanding is Johnson & Johnson is something like 72%, um, while the double dose of Moderna or Pfizer would be something like 85 plus. Uh, so 72, definitely less, but still quite favorable. Um, and we will see in terms of whether that needs a booster sooner, um, whether that lasts as long, but it would be nice to have a third supply line just to get additional vaccine into the system. Okay, thank you, Travis. Yes, ma'am. Susan LaRue. Yes, I was, I'd like to find out how the vaccine appointments are scheduled. Do the planners need to understand how many vaccines they're getting the next day to inform the people to, uh, for the schedule? Like how is that process coordinated? Yes, absolutely. So that one is each week, uh, usually either Friday or Saturday, we learn from the state what our allocation is going to be for the coming week. Um, the last month or so, uh, it's been pretty standard. It's been about 300, which is the baseline for what any county will receive. Uh, but we always petition for more. Um, excuse me. As of last week, uh, our health officer in our agency uh, sent a request over to the state to um, <laughs> ask for additional vaccine based on the fact that our uh, because the, the allocation is done by population. So our year-round population is about 52 to 54,000. Our seasonal population is somewhere north of 250,000. Um, our belief is that we are getting a lot more than our general population, people coming to schedule the vaccine, so that using that 52,000 number isn't really fair in terms of how much we're being allocated. Uh, so we had requested to get more. The wonderful Worcester County Commission, in, uh, Commission has also supported reaching out to the state for additional supplies of vaccine. I know that they sent a letter up, I believe it was last week to the state, uh, petitioning for just uh, more than that 300 or so base doses. But to go back to your original question, it is usually at the end of the week, we find out how much we are gonna get for the next round of clinics. And then we find out how much both first dose and second dose we will receive. And we schedule appointments around that. So we don't contact people on the waiting list until we know for sure that we're gonna have a vaccine for them available in the next round of clinics. Okay, thank you. And one more question. Do you have to be a full-time resident of Worcester County to receive the vaccine? So at this time, no. The directive that we have gotten from the state, as far as we understand it, is that because the vaccine is a Maryland resource um, and because it's coming from a federal program, we are not supposed to put hard residency restrictions on who can sign up for a COVID vaccine. Now, we are aware that there are some counties in Maryland who have limited to either full-time residents or those who work and live within their county. Uh, this is something that I personally have asked for clarification from the state on because it is uneven in the way that it's being presented. And we know that that is not really fair. So I'm hoping to get something in writing uh, from the state to clarify what they mean. During a communication call about registration a week or so ago, uh, one of the representatives from the state did mention that there's an expectation of reasonable restrictions, or it was the exact verbiage that he used, that a county health department could put on registration. However, exactly what that means wasn't crystal clear um, or directed to us in writing. So if reasonable restrictions means that you have to either live full time in Worcester or work here or just own property here, we would like to know so that we can communicate that to our community because at this time we are not capping things based on uh, registration because that was what we were told we shouldn't do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions? No? Well, then I will read the questions that were sent in. Oh, I'm sorry, Linda, you have a question? Zang? Uh, just, just one. Go ahead. If there is any plan for uh, participating with uh, physicians that send the vaccine to physicians' offices. 
I'm sorry, was a question uh, to, to are we sending vaccine to physician offices directly? Yeah, is that, is that in the plan? Uh, well, so yeah, um, at this point, the state is already sending it over to independent healthcare resources such as um, Title Health and Atlantic General Hospital. They all have their own different branches. I don't know if it's being sent to anyone who is outside of those healthcare systems, but I do know that it's being directed to those private organizations. So anyone who might be uh, a Title Health healthcare um, participant responder, they would have the opportunity to get vaccine based on whatever that hospital system is. But again, those are independent from us. We all coordinate together, we communicate together, and we work closely within the county, but they are scheduling and distributing the vaccine uh, through their own system. Thank you. Sure. Is there anyone else that have questions that they wanted to ask? Okay, we have just a handful of questions that were sent in in advance. Um, Travis, the first one is, when will the vaccines be readily available without having to, without having to jump through hoops to get on a waiting list somewhere? Um, I think you... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would, it's already. that is a wonderful question. I, I <laughs> wish we knew I, as soon as the, I, I guess the state um, sends us enough vaccine to match the waiting list that we're seeing. Okay. Uh, the next one is, um, it has an interesting analogy. The state website to sign up for appointments and the process for it needs changing. It's like buying concert tickets, but you have no idea when they go on sale. I think this might just be more of a statement. Um, a simple solution would be posted at an exact given time. And I don't think you know that. And I think you handled that already with. Sure. Well, I will mention on this one, uh, we completely get that. At the time when we were using MarylandVax.org, because that was the, the system that every county was really supposed to try to use, we did aim for um, specific times during the week. For us, it was usually Thursday mornings around 9 a.m. when we would post our clinics. Uh, we did put messaging out there to the newspapers and radio and TV, and then as well as our social media about that. Um, however, as I said earlier, usually within 30 to 40 minutes, those were taken anyways. I think the concert ticket is a really great analogy. <laughs> they, were, they were being scooped up just because there weren't that many spots and people were waiting for it. Uh, but we do know that that system was frustrating. Uh, it, it felt not great to see those clinics disappear before you could get there. And that's why we now have this one singular waiting list where you call in, if you are eligible within the phases, we'll put your name on there. Um, and then we will get to people through different priorities as directed by the state. Okay. Travis, is there a certain browser that you recommend? For uh, using Maryland? For the, yes, because well, we have seen in our community that you can do Firefox, Chrome, Chrome, um, in, what is it, incognito or something. Mm -hmm. Some are lucky and some are not. Well, for... Our clinics, we're not currently posting them on MarylandVax.org. We've moved entirely to using that 667 number to get people on a waiting list because we recognize that uh, MarylandVax.org was, was difficult to work with and people hated seeing those clinics just disappear. In terms of just overall browser recommendations, always Google Chrome, 100% always Google Chrome. Um, we hope to move back to posting clinics on MarylandVax.org as soon as our supply picks up or the demand ticks down uh, or ideally both. Um, but for the time being, we are asking everyone to just call in. You will talk to staff. You might be on hold for a little bit due to the volume of the calls, but you won't have to use MarylandVax.org. Um, you can speak to a live actual human being and they will take your information and they will put your name on the list again if you are eligible. Okay. Um, another question from the list here. Any way to find out your place on the list once signed up? No, so the uh, it shifts around a lot because it is, again, based on the combination of first come, first serve, plus the priority of 65 and older, and then um, any allocations that we have to make uh, out of the supply that we receive each week, whether it's for educators, whether it's for a different group um, as directed by the state. And there are new names added each week, so it kind of shifts around a lot. The main thing to remember is getting on as early as possible is good because we are working our way sequentially through that. Uh, and then the priority of if you are 65 and older, 
um, or very high risk, then you're going to be called sooner. Okay. Uh, the last, the last question that I have, um, why does the county say it is giving priority to those 65 and older when class one C includes teachers and some essential worker workers who are under 65. The county news release indicated it was doing so at the direction of the state, but I have seen no state directive that teachers and essential workers will not be vaccinated until all class one C people 65 and over are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that goes back to uh, we are supposed to set aside a certain percentage, um, I think usually a third as of the last time, last time I checked, for uh, educators. Um, I'm not sure if it also includes some of those essential workers, but basically it is prioritizing that 65 plus group uh, for the majority of our vaccine and then carving out another piece for those who are um, not in that priority group. And there is information on the state website that I can share uh, very easily that that does talk about 65 and plus being a priority. And then, um, Josh, I will send you some information tomorrow about just that exact breakdown. Uh, as much of that is, is, is public information that we can share. But that's sort of the long and short of it is that the majority of the vaccine we get each week is supposed to go to older residents because the state recognizes that they are more vulnerable and they tend to have more severe reactions to COVID-19. Um, however, we aren't kicking everyone else that's within that eligibility group out if they're under 65. It's just a smaller allocation each week is being carved aside for them. Okay. Do we I, I wondered I, I wondered if you I wondered if you could comment on the CDC guidance that was released uh, uh, within the last 24 hours about quarantining and post uh, quarantining post-vaccination people. Well, I'm going to have to look it up real quick if it was just released. Um, let's see, what to expect. Is this the what's expect after getting a COVID-19 vaccine? All right. Fully vaccinated people don't need to quarantine after COVID exposure. Okay, I see that now. Um, yeah, we do. And again, this is something where it goes way back to uh, what I said at the beginning. Um, I'm not sure if everyone was on the call, but it's it's very much a, uh, a new day, new way kind of situation. And we are rolling with that with CDC. So the CDC, their guidelines do seem like they've been adapted to say that fully vaccinated persons who meet criteria will no longer be required to quarantine following an exposure to some of COVID-19. A lot of that goes back to, at least with these current uh, vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer having such a high rate who um, of vaccination protection from COVID. So the criteria includes having had both shots of either Pfizer or Moderna. And that's really important because these ramp up. So when you receive either of those first doses, every day you gain a percentage of resistance basically to COVID-19. Once you get that second final booster shot, um, that puts you above that 85, 90% mark, which is in terms of infection control, very high. So having had both of those shots uh, and at least two weeks have gone by since the second dose was administered because that boost also needs time to settle in. Studies have shown that full immunity um, is not built up until a couple of weeks after finishing, after finishing the vaccine regime. So if you've had both of your shots and it's been several weeks, the CDC uh, is saying that you will not need to quarantine with an exposure because your level of um, resistance or immunity is uh, very high at that point. But there are very few people in the general population who have had both shots that have also had weeks for it to settle in. So this is something that will um, take some time to get into there. And this is just a recommendation from CDC. That's important to remember. And it's, this recommendation is to waive quarantine for people with vaccine derived immunity that aligns with quarantine recommendations for those with natural immunity, which eases implementation. So I can share some more resources here from uh, CDC and I'll send those to Josh in the morning to send out to everyone. But that is the long and short of it is that it looks like the resistance from the two shots, as long as they have time to work up to that natural level of immunity is quite high. And they are recommending um, waiving those requirements for quarantine. Yeah. And just real quick, anything Travis shares, we'll put on oceanfinds.org. Sounds good. Does anyone have any more questions for Travis? 
<laughs> Go ahead. Do we have any idea when the uh, different phases will kick in? Um, right now we're in phase one, A, B, C. When will phase two? Because I think I'm a phase three guy and I have to wait a long time. So yes. I'm too young. <laughs> So uh, in terms of when the next phase will move on, the directive we've heard latest from the governor is that it will be once we have um, the majority of phase one vaccinated, all of that is tied at the supply. So hopefully the vaccine amount will ramp up and um, the number of people who are covered in phase one will get vaccinated sooner rather than later, especially if Johnson & Johnson, if that third vaccine supply line opens up. Uh, then that'll be really good. And hopefully, I know I, I know that there's no magic crystal ball for it. You know, at this, at, at least at this current rate, it would be in the spring um, that we probably move to phase two. And if vaccine supplies increase, it would be sooner. Okay. Sounds good. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah, we do. Brian. Yes, thank you, Jenny. Um, regarding the qualifications for stage two, phase two, um, I've been unable to really pin down what the qualifications are for if you have health conditions for um, being an older adult. And do you have a, a place where we could look and see? I mean, we're, we're not old enough to qualify for 65 and above, but Almost. we think we're almost qualified for, you know, being close to that. So mm -hmm. um, where can we find out about what health conditions will qualify for, for phase two? So that list is generally updated. There are some handy graphics uh, with a pyramid about what, what falls under each phase on governor Larry Hogan's website, as well as Maryland department of health. Um, again, I'll find the Links give them to Josh. I know I'm looking at the basic chart for phase two right now, which is in broad strokes, adults 16 to 64 at an increased risk of severe COVID-19 illness due to comorbidities, essential workers and critical utilities, transportation, food service, et cetera. And then phase three is just gonna be the general population, including healthy adults age 16 to 64. So I'm sure the governor's office will provide some additional clarification once we move closer to phase two of everyone who's involved. I will say from my personal experience that they usually err on the side of including uh, more people than fewer. So what their definition of um, increased risk and comorbidities, I imagine that will be painted with a very broad brush. So if you have uh, severe chronic conditions, anything that could really risk your um, your health, safety, your life with COVID-19 will most likely be moved into phase two. Okay, great. That's good to hear. And uh, lastly, out of curiosity, are you, are, is the Eastern Shore primarily getting the Moderna vaccine at this time? So we've been getting a mix in the county. At the health department, we've only been getting Moderna because Pfizer has to be stored at incredibly low temperatures, which we did not have um, the infrastructure for, I believe that AGH and Tidal Health both do. Uh, it's something like extraordinarily sub-zero temperatures um, for Pfizer. Moderna is a lot more stable in terms of being a vaccine. So it is more widespread, which means that it's also more requested because very few locations do have the ability to store Pfizer. My understanding is also that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, if that is approved, hopefully, knocking on wood, uh, is also easier to store. So we should be getting some of that. So a mix has come to the Eastern shore. The only one right now that the health department is using is Moderna. Okay. Thanks. Understood. Sounds good. Thank yes, you. Sir. And Brian, real quick, I put that, uh, pyramid in the meeting chat. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Susan LaRue. How is the county tracking the side effects of the vaccine for those ha that have received it? So that's really a state effort. In a lot of ways, it's it's a national effort. Uh, people are keeping an eye on it at this time. The vast majority of cases of people who receive the first dose report very minimal side effects. Uh, with the second dose, there have been reports of flu-like symptoms um, that could be moderate to moderately severe, usually within the first 24 hours, the majority of those being chills, body aches, uh, and exhaustion. So all that is being compiled through Maryland Department of Health. We are tracking the information that we get 
um, specifically too from our staff who get uh, the vaccine from different age groups, different demographics, and then all of that is going up to Maryland. I believe I'm pretty confident that the states are sharing that data federally. So we're all kind of on the same page in terms of what the side effects have. And so far, there have been no real long-term side effects with Pfizer and Moderna. And I say so far in long-term because both of them, of course, have only entered production uh, within the last year and entered distribution within the last several months to the public. Um, so we are tracking it. The public health as just a general entity is keeping an eye on everything and side effects. But in terms of the testing that was done prior to this being available to the public and the results that we're seeing so far, neither vaccine seems to have particularly severe side effects, um, especially with the first dose of the second one, it might uh, knock you out for a day or two, basically is what we're hearing. Um, and we'll continue to watch it and we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, that has not been an issue in terms of people's enthusiasm for it. Uh, we've had a lot of people who are certainly judging that the, uh, the, the side effects, is, as far as we understand currently, is far outweighed by the risks uh, of COVID-19. So I guess the, that's a super long way to answer your very simple and short question is that everyone is monitoring it within the state of Maryland and Maryland Health Department. Um, and so far, so good. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, good emotion that came from you. <laughs> how, how are they reported, though? I mean, I don't know anyone that has gotten a call that has had the vaccine that said that asked them if they had any side effects. Is it up to the person that received the vaccine that does have side effects to report that? So it would in terms of the general population. Um, we do have, and remember that phase 1A was primarily healthcare workers. So we have a lot of our own um, staff basically is, I don't want to say guinea pigs, but kind of as guinea pigs in terms of what this would be. That is being tracked internally within all of the health departments uh, and at a much wider lens, um, CDC, FDA, they are all monitoring uh, with different control groups. We aren't as far as I know, generally calling people that have gotten their vaccine and checking in, but that is not something that is off the table. It's just very few people at this point have gotten both doses and had several months to see if anything happens. Uh, it does seem from what we have noticed within healthcare staff, whether it's doctors, nurses, frontline workers, um, and our first responders uh, that got this dose initially with phase 1A, very few have reported any side effects following the first couple of days after the second dose. So I don't know. I can tell you I'm not sure if we will ever reach out and do surveys or focus groups locally in Worcester County. I do know that CDC and FDA are looking at um, checking in along the line as these go. And then internally within the Maryland Health Department system, we are tracking our own staff who have gotten the vaccine just to see what happens. And so far, so good. And not Thank you. Yes. Do we have more questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, thank you for those of you who attended and, and especially thank you, Travis, for taking the time to uh, to work with us. Thanks, Travis, thanks, Josh. Thank you all, I appreciate you having me on here and uh, any questions, um, I'm, Josh has my contact information. You can send anything to me as a follow-up and I'll give him some of those resources that I mentioned today and I appreciate everyone tuning in. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you so much. Everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.